Live from WTVO 17 and your home team, Eyewitness News at 5 starts now. Rockford's District 1 Police Headquarters sign is vandalized again. Coming up, police share details with us that led to the arrest. Plus, the COVID-19 pandemic has changed the way many kids are taught in school, but a state line school shows how they give students a break from wearing masks during the day. And city officials ob observe history of indigenous people in the Forest City, what they hope residents will do to learn more about the culture. Good evening, I'm Alexis Carpello. Thanks for joining us tonight. A man is arrested for vandalizing Rockford Police District 1 sign. You can see here, we had to blur out some profanity that was sprayed onto the sign. A group of protesters were at District 1 on Friday. That's when officers noticed three people spray painting the sign near West State Street. Police say the suspects tried to run away. One got caught, the other two weren't found. Sean Haber was arrested. He's charged with criminal damage to state property and resisting arrest. Please ask if anyone has information to call them or Crime Stoppers. Statewide, over 2,700 new cases of COVID-19 are being reported today, raising the state total to more than 319,000 cases. Nine additional deaths were reported today. However, none were local. The statewide positivity rate raises to 4.2 percent, nearly two weeks later of stricter mitigation in Region 1. The positivity rate climbs to over 9 percent. Saturday night, more than 1,700 people were in the hospital fighting the virus. Nearly 400 are in the ICU and 159 were on ventilators. As COVID-19 cases continue to climb, one state line school took their lessons outdoors. Michelle Rave explains how it's a chance for a breath of fresh air for both students and staff. So it's just been nice to take a break from the classroom. It's a break students get at Keep Country Day School, a step away from the traditional classroom and a breath of fresh air. We've had the opportunity to have the tents outside since the start of the school year. It's been really nice to give the students the opportunity to come outside, get some fresh air. Charo Cheney, the co-head of Middle and Upper School, says so far it's been very successful. The teachers um, will bring their equipment out here to work with the students. When they're out here, they can also take off their masks because we have the desk spaced out as well. Cheney says the small classroom sizes allows for a safer environment for the students. We'll have the teacher and then we'll have approximately like 15 students max. Um, but then also we do have our remote students. So the teachers will bring their laptops out and our other uh, remote students can remote in as well. It's not just PE classes that are held outside. All classes, we've had our band class out here quite a bit, drama. They love to come and use the space because they can go inside the tent and then step outside of the tent to do different activities as well. English, English classes out here, we've had a couple of math classes and science as well. But it's not just Keith Country Day School that's utilizing outdoor spaces. Scott Salinger, owner of Northwest Rental Service in McChesney Park, says he's gotten a lot of businesses from several local schools. We've done a lot with schools. Uh, each school in Roscoe, there's a lot of them that have tents uh, to help on the outside. Trying to create social distancing and I think PE and other other classes that could be held outside are. Cheney says as the colder weather approaches, the school has talked about the future of these tents. We have some talks of getting some heaters out here so that we can use it as long as we can. We know that we're not going to be able to use it all winter long, but we want to use it as long as we can. Reporting for your home team, I'm Michelle Rave. If you're in need of adding more food to your shelves, Northern Illinois is hosting a food bank on Monday. The food bank will be in the parking lot of First United Methodist Church in Belvedere. Volunteers will start distributing food at 4. It's a first-come, first-served basis until supplies run out. Anyone is welcome. The groceries will be prepackaged boxes, and volunteers will put the food directly into cars. For more information on the food bank, find this article on MyStateLine.com. The Forest City officially dedicates a day to recognize Indigenous people. In a proclamation from the city, October 12th will now be recognized as Indigenous Peoples Day. City leaders say Rockford holds a significant amount of Native American history. Although Monday is also recognized as Columbus Day, one alderman says it's not about celebrating one idea over the other, but also recognizing a group that was native to the land. It's important for us to celebrate all groups of people. And when, when we know that we're not doing that, when, when we know that uh, people are kind of being left behind, I think this is a really, really important day for us to move forward as a city to say, 
hey, you know, everyone, you know, needs needs to be celebrated at some point. Century-old effigy mounds, part of Native American culture, reside in Beatty Park. Illinois is posed to make major changes to how police do their jobs. Governor Pritzker released a list of policy guidelines for passing reforms. Cole Hankey shares there's already some pushback from police chiefs and sheriffs. Governor Pritzker hopes to have a new set of criminal justice policies passed sooner rather than later. And I hope that we're going to be taking this up in the veto session. Uh, it's something that I've worked hard with the Black Caucus on. But some of the departments directly affected by those changes say they were left out of the discussions. Sangamon County Sheriff Jack Campbell is on the Legislative Committee for the Illinois Sheriff's Association. He said that the organization did not have a hand in making these rules. So we want to participate. We want to tell them our frustrations and changes we'd like to see made also, but we'd like some uh, reasonableness involved here. So some of the things that he suggested are things that we're all for, and some of them we're not. They simply won't work. Pritzker's wish list includes stricter training and licensing requirements for law enforcement, sentencing reform for drug offenses, and the elimination of cash bond. But the governor also wants a complete ban on no-knock warrants, something Sheriff Campbell argues could put officers in harm's way. When we ask for a no-knock warrant, it's because there's an immediate threat to our lives, the lives of the officers going in, and there's no way we would ever sign off on on uh, agreeing to a no-knock search warrant never being allowed. It, it's, it's dangerous and it should never be discussed. Christian County Sheriff Bruce Kettlecamp isn't against more training for his deputies, but says it has to come with more funding, especially for smaller departments. Whenever we have to train, when we go to train, we either have to pay overtime or give them comp time, and that's just very, it's very, very hard for smaller departments the governor's guidelines come after months of protests against police brutality and abuse of power. But Campbell isn't convinced that those problems are widespread. So I'm not going to start with the premise that there's a big problem in law enforcement because there isn't. So we, we have historically policed ourselves. Um, is it perfect system? No. It, you know, if we, we'll work together to create a better system because we want to be held accountable. We want to hold others accountable and we're willing to work with the governor's office, but we have to have a seat at the table. Members of the Senate Judiciary Committee will return to Washington this week as Capitol Hill tries to contain the latest coronavirus outbreak. The committee will begin a week-long hearings to question President Trump's Supreme Court nominee, Judge Amy Coney Barrett. And Warnicki is keeping you connected to the nation's capital. The Senate Judiciary Committee will gavel in Monday morning to question President Trump's Supreme Court nominee, Judge Amy Coney Barrett. Some members are expected to participate remotely after two Republican members of the committee, Utah Senator Mike Lee and North Carolina Senator Tom Tillis, tested positive for the coronavirus last week. I think the president's decision to nominate Judge Barrett may well have been the most important decision of his presidency. Texas Republican Senator Ted Cruz says he expects the Senate to confirm Barrett before Election Day. And when the Senate does so, we will be honoring the promise we made to the American people. But Democrats, including Oregon Senator Ron Wyden, oppose Barrett because of her legal views and the way she was nominated. Donald Trump's priority is to jam through a lifetime appointment for a judge who's going to roll back protections for so many of those people are hurting. It is a very distorted set of priorities. Barrett met with more than a dozen senators ahead of her confirmation hearing, including six Democrats on the Judiciary Committee. I was heartened, but not surprised to hear you talk about your judicial philosophy, not viewing the judicial decision-making process as policy-making because judges don't run for election. If the Senate Judiciary Committee approves Barrett's nomination, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says he hopes for a full Senate vote before the end of October. In Washington, I'm Anna Warnicke. Now, your first warm weather forecast with Chief Meteorologist Candace King. If you're able to get out and enjoy this weekend, absolutely gorgeous out there. A live look with our Mercy Sky SkyTrack camera out of the Rochelle Airport. Lots of sunshine right before the sun does set here just a little before 6.30 this evening. Get out and enjoy. Very comfortable, too. And this weekend, a beautiful weekend to get out, enjoy some of the fall colors. A little on the breezy side yesterday. Friday, it was pretty windy, and we're starting to notice the winds picking
picking up uh, here this afternoon and evening as well. Randy Schumacher shared his fall picture with us. See King at WTVO.com is where you can share those fall photos. I'll tell you the colors really uh, starting to pop here with some of these warm days and these cool nights that we've had. And this afternoon, no exception. As our wind continues to come in from the east, you've got a little bit of cooling a bit further off to our northeast where we've got a few extra clouds. Still at 69 in Belvedere, but 75 right now in Rockford and Rochelle, 77 down in Dixon and close to 80 degrees right now in Sterling. Look at the warmth off to the west. We've actually got a pretty significant storm system moving in across the Rockies and the High Plains. You can tell by the difference in temperatures and that wind direction too. Now that is a cold front that'll be moving closer to us as we head through the morning hours tomorrow. But we stay on the warmer side of things as we go through the night tonight. So this means another mild night with our temperatures hard pressed to fall much below that 60 degree mark tomorrow morning. Now you may be thinking, great, a mild start for our Monday. Downfall with that cold front, we are going to get a chance for rain and even an isolated thunderstorm or two. So the first half of our Monday is going to be a little bit on the rainy side. Cold front comes in. We won't see a big drop in our temperatures, but we will stay in the 60s for tomorrow afternoon. Clear skies with us this evening. Showers, thunderstorms, couple severe thunderstorm warnings now crossing over into northwest Iowa, far southwest Minnesota. Do not have to worry about any severe weather for us. In fact, as that cold front comes in, timing just not ideal. We could, however, get some gusty winds with some of the stronger cells that we may have as we go through the noon hour tomorrow. So plan on a rainy start tomorrow morning. Cold front then comes through about 12, 1 o'clock. Notice then we start to dry out as we get a little bit further into the afternoon. As we do, the wind will be picking up from the northwest. It'll be shifting around to the northwest. We stay dry Monday night. Tuesday is going to be a dry day too. Winds will pick up just a little bit as we head towards Tuesday afternoon. The reason why we don't get a big drop behind our temperatures initially or behind that cold front is because the wind in the jet stream will be coming in more from the west to east. But by the time we get into Wednesday evening, we actually start to get a little dip in that jet stream. This is a stronger cold front that comes through, really pulls down that cooler air as we head towards the end of the week. Highs stuck in the 50s. So down to 60 degrees for tonight. Tomorrow we're up to 65. So not a lot of range in that temperature because that cold front is coming in. And tomorrow is going to be a windy day. Peak winds could be gusting 35 to even 40 miles per hour. So that may be a hiccup if you're getting out into the fields tomorrow, especially during the morning hours. Tuesday, Wednesday, we should be okay. However, the wind will be a little bit on the gusty side and that could elevate our fire danger for both Tuesday and Wednesday. Notice the drop from the 70s, Alexis, into the 50s, and we could even potentially see a hard freeze as we head later in the week. Now, the Napleton Sports Desk with David Greenberg. Week five in the NFL, the Jaguars were down in Houston taking on the winless Texans. Let's see how James Robinson did today. Jags' first play from scrimmage was this here from Robinson. He takes this one up the gut for 11 yards. It was a tough battle for him the rest of the day, though. He finished with 13 rushes for 48 yards and an additional five catches for 22 yards. This next play pretty much summed up the Jags' day. A fourth and one with Robinson and the Wildcat. He bobbles it, and they turn it over on downs. Texans pick up their first win with a 30-14 to victory. Here's an interesting stat for you. Robinson finished with 70 total yards today, but had he finished with at least 90, he would have joined this list of pretty big-named running backs to record at least 90-plus yards from scrimmage through their first five career games. But unfortunately, Robinson finished 20 yards short of that number today, but it does not take away any of his accomplishments so far. No Bears or Packers today, but there was still some really good games around the league, like this one in Kansas City. This one had a lot of offense and plenty of flash. Here's this one from Derek Carr to Henry Ruggs for a 77-yard score. During the week, Derek Carr talked about this rivalry, saying it really isn't a rivalry because he hasn't beaten them yet. Yet. He might get his shot today. Raiders up late in the fourth. Mahomes trying to lead a comeback over the middle, and it's picked off, returned down to the one-yard line. Raiders punched it in, ending the Chiefs' win streak at 13 games. Las Vegas Gruden pulls off the 40-32 upset. 
This was another great one in Pittsburgh. Wentz and the Eagles were down 17 at one point, but were able to battle back to pull to within two, thanks to this touchdown catch by Travis Fulgham. Now, final minutes of the fourth. Eagles need a stop on third and eight to get the ball back, but Big Ben finds Chase Claypool, who makes his way to the end zone for a touchdown. That was Claypool's fourth touchdown of the day. The former Notre Dame receiver's big day locks this one up for the Steelers. They improved to 4-0 with a 38-29 win. Game 6 of the NBA Finals is coming up in a little bit right here on WTVO. LeBron James and the Lakers are looking to close this one out. They hold a 3-2 lead in the series. There's the Larry O'Brien trophy being carried in. LeBron is looking for ring number 4, but Jimmy Butler and the Miami Heat are not going down without a fight. Jimmy Butler was sensational in a 111-108 Game 5 victory, playing in 47 of 48 minutes and recording a 35-point triple-double. James finished with 40 points and 13 rebounds. That one set the tip at 6.30. Again, you can catch all that action right here on WTVO. Championship Series round is set, and the American League will get things going tonight as well. After defeating the New York Yankees in a wild elimination game, the Tampa Bay Rays will take on the Houston Astros in a best-of-seven series. That one's set for 6:37 tonight. Astros are trying to get back to the World Series for the third time in four years. On the National League side, the Atlanta Braves will play the Los Angeles Dodgers, making the, uh, the Braves making their first NLCS appearance since 2001, while the Dodgers are making their fourth in the last five years.